first off, I'd be embarrassed to think that somebody would believe that I wrote as badly as ChatGPT. <laughs> but I have used it for ideas. It's all about moving people from mindless work to mindful work. And the question is, at some point, you know, when the AI gets better and better, are you going to start excluding large swaths of the population that maybe can't operate up in the 98th percentile or whatever that the computer is doing? It's going to be amazing to see where this goes because it's moving so quickly where it goes in the next few years. But uh, I don't think we're right on the doorstep of uh, our um, AI is having uh, sentience and personalities and, and all that. Hello, and welcome to Tech for Finance, where we help finance professionals leverage technology to level up their lives. I'm your host, Adam Shilton, and in this episode, we're chatting with Glenn Hopper, CFO and finance megastar with over 20 years experience leading finance operations. Glenn is also an author known for his industry-renowned book, Deep Finance, that charts the course for modern CFOs in leading digital transformation using AI. After starting his career as a journalist for the Navy, Glenn moved quickly into finance and then CFO positions for several scale-up companies. His most recent move has seen him become director and CFO for the Aventus Advisory Group, who provides CFO services for SMEs. In his spare time, Glenn is a triathlete and marathoner, is in the process of finishing a 200,000-word sci-fi epic novel, and a little known fact about Glenn is he also wrote an indie film called The Hanged Man, which you can find on Netflix in the US. Now, before you start, if you like what you hear today, please make sure to, to subscribe to Tech for Finance on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube. But uh, once again, thanks, thanks for joining me today, Glenn. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having me, Adam. I'm glad to be here. Very good. So we, we had a bit of a, a catch up before this session, didn't we? We, we had um, half an hour a couple of weeks ago and, and we were introduced through our for our friend, Paul Barnhurst, who, who many of you know as the FPNA guy, um, who runs uh, FPNA today. Um, so Glenn was recently on the FPNA podcast, I believe released today. I think it's the 14th of March today, just so that people have got that, that timestamp. Um, and what we're going to try and do today is not cover similar territory from FPNA today. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll link to the FPNA podcast in the show notes for this. Um, but we'll try and give a, a slightly different perspective so that Glenn's not having to say the same thing that he probably says all the time. His podcast. <laughs> so Glenn, it's up to you to, to correct me where you can and make sure that we cover new territory, eh? So, uh, no, all, all good. So, so first, uh, I mean, it'd be great to understand, um, especially given all of the, the upheaval in the market now around ChatGPT3 and, and, and all of those sorts of areas. To you specifically, who's been working in the AI space or the finance and AI, AI space for a while, why did you decide to focus so heavily on the, the AI piece as, as part of your journey in finance? Yeah, good question, Adam. I think it's, for me, um, the move towards focus on AI has really been just a focus throughout my finance career on whatever the latest technology is and being able to use that to improve finance. And I go back to before I had my first CFO role, when I was working in, um, in telecommunications in the early two thousands, I had, I was a FinOps guy that didn't roll up to the CFO. I rolled up to the COO and the, um, I was basically responsible for getting all the, uh, budget information and the procurement and the purchase information for the COO. But at the time, um, the controller at the company was not keen to share financial data with me. So we were tracking everything in spreadsheets, so much manual work, and it was very difficult the scale of the purchases we were making and, and what we were trying to keep up with to manage to budget when you couldn't get access uh, in as close to real time as possible to the financial data. So when we're keeping two sets of records and everybody who's been in finance for more than a minute knows that, th that that's going to lead to problems when you don't have a single source of truth. So my, my tech focus came when I had to fight the battle to get access through an API or, and I don't even remember how we were connected back then, uh, in the early two thousands, but to get access to the financial data so that we could do our job and in the course of that. So I had to learn a little bit about kind of what was going on under the hood and how we could, uh, <laughs> that was my first ex uh, experience with databases and me and my senior manager at the time, uh, were using Microsoft access. So we were just pulling the information down and throwing it in a database. And we went from reporting on 
lagging information to as soon as a purchase order was entered into the uh, accounting system, we had immediate access to it. We had as close as, as we could back then to real-time information, and it really changed the nature of the work we were doing and the quality of work that we were doing. So I, from my very first finance role, I've seen the importance of being able to get data out of systems, to interact with systems and not rely on people emailing spreadsheets and transferring information that way. So that kind of started me, I mean, I'd say my, my tech focus, as I've learned more through my career about finance, it's technology has been joined at the hip with that. And we've, um, in every company I've been in, I guess, after I left telecom and went to smaller startup companies, um, I realized that the way, if you're trying to get the attention of whether it's private equity or, or banks for lending or wherever you're going out to raise money, or if you're looking to do M and a activity, that one of the secrets to that was to look like a bigger company than you are. And that means more detailed financial reports and more detailed KPIs and really take an ownership of that. And I'm, I'm giving you a really long winded answer, but it's going to get to the AI prompt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in that, I, uh, I found a way to connect, um, to our point of sale systems. And at this point, this is in mid two thousands. I finally now have, uh, access in real time to, I was working for a retail company. I could see sales and SKUs and what was happening in real time. And we built this dashboard for our investors and for the management where you could go in real time and, and uh, look at all these results. We built a bunch of metrics and um, it really, we, this company was built to sell and it was, uh, I'd say a financially led company. So I just really started diving in deeper and embracing what can we track. And we, we built our own um, inventory management system. We're watching chemical levels and um, monitoring utility use. And, uh, it was really that, that was probably the coolest, uh, tool that I had part in building was getting all this real-time information and being able to report these metrics and just having it automated because that freed up my time to shift my focus from just gathering the information and creating reports to, um, actually doing the more detailed analysis and being able to, whether we're talking to the banks or to the board or wh whomever, being able to give them really that next level deep, um, analysis that, uh, that, you know, it, I think it made the company look better. It looked like <laughs> operational excellence is, uh, is a big theme in my career and something that I always have my team strive for. And I think with that, we were able to show that we had a handle on what was going on with our business and we knew which levers to pull to change it. So that's that technology iteration and then continued with small companies, small staffs. Uh, I'm always looking to automate. Um, and one of my tricks to automating was, uh, taking financial statements and throwing them into database tables and being able to do automated analysis on them. And through all that, <laughs> and now we're, we're getting close to the AI part. Um, so, uh, I went and got a, a, a graduate certificate in business analytics back in about 2018. And this was incredibly eye-opening for me because all the, I mean, I've always thought of myself as a great FP&A guy and, uh, I love modeling. That's my favorite part of the job. And I've built pretty complex models over the years, but, um, just in, in, in Excel. And when I saw what people were doing with these machine learning algorithms at that point and how much better models they were able to build with that. I just realized, and in the whole program, there was very little talk about using this in finance. Most of it was, uh, sales and marketing. It seems like sales and marketing definitely got the, uh, got the jump there. And so I, at that point made it my mission. It's cause I, th I like to think of FP and a people as we're the original business analysts. I mean, think about all the models we've built over the years. And I thought we need to be sure that we know these tools are out there. And that sort of started my journey down the machine learning path is just, if you can go from, you know, linear regression or polynomial regression or whatever you're doing to build your models. And now you've got, uh, you're able to build statistical models that have way more features than you would have considered using maybe in your Excel models. And you have different correlations, how accurate you can get on these forecasts. And so by using machine learning algorithms in finance and, and building out these models and, um, finding ways to do it because I'm, I'm not a developer. Uh, I basically just know enough to be dangerous, but through all that, I've been very, um, 
tied in to um, what's going on in the AI and machine learning world. And I took uh, Andrew Ng's um, uh, AI class and, and several others. Just again, not that I'm wanting to be an engineer, but I feel like it's incumbent on finance people to really understand the technology that's out there. So that all leads up to uh, where we are now with AI. And I think, you know, chat GPT that we've been talking about is the most accessible form, the most, I mean, you know, recommendation engines and stuff that, you know, the net, I'm thinking back to the Netflix contest mm -hmm. um, for, uh, you know, who could make the best recommendations or what Amazon uses to recommend similar products. I mean, machine learning has been out there forever, but it's sort of been quiet in the background. I mean, I think about the predictive text on your phone and on your, when you're writing an email, um, you know, that's been out there, but chat GPT is, you know, going to a hundred million users and however few days they did. I mean, it's, it, it's the most accessible AI that's out there. And so it just was a natural progression for me. And I'm, I started this, my last project that I did very, you know, within days of uh, chat GPT being publicly released. And I wanted to do something different because I knew a lot of people were going to be, um, doing in, you know, using APIs and, and make, doing interfaces with, uh, now they're out there for Google sheets and for Excel. And, um, I really wanted to see how it was at coding. So my, my project that I just did with it, um, I had chat GPT, write All the code for this, uh, application that, uh, that, uh, FPNA specialists can use. Mm -hmm. And I, I have, I haven't read the, the full PDF view building the tool. Um, I've got semi-detailed, but again, I like you, cause I've been reading your book, you know, you, you started with, you know, HTML and a bit of JavaScript and all that sort of stuff. That that's, that's basically, you know, my grounding in, in coding. Um, and as I said, in a previous podcast, I, I have been plugging chat GPT into stuff like Google docs and Excel, but I've just been copying scripts from GitHub. I've just been changing the prompts over. So that that's the limit of my development knowledge. Um, but I'll link to that in, to, in the show notes, cause I think it's very interesting. If not. The end result of producing the tool it's the it's the methodology that you 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 applied during that process you know so i think some of the ways that you handled um asking the questions and using the correct prompts worded in the right way is something that everybody can learn from yeah that's a great point and there's I've, <laughs> if you've been on youtube in the past two months there are a million of course this is the youtube algorithm has figured out that i uh am interested in this stuff but um there's a million videos out there that are just training you how to write proper prompts for mm. chat GPT, which I thought was interesting. Cause I remember I'm old. So, uh, I remember when, uh, internet search was first out there, you had to, you know, you would use Boolean or you'd, you'd have to do things like if you wanted it to search for two words, you know, you'd say, uh, financial plus planning plus analysis, or you'd have to put things in quotes. And it was very, you know, you, you had, there was more, uh, science required to get good search results and Google and, uh, other search engines have figured out, you know, how to, uh, how to return better search results with all, without all that now. But I think chat GPT in this nascent early stage, it's similar. You have to know how to, uh, how to prompt it to get the right results and how to get it to. In, in the case of writing code, how to get it to uh, QC the code and fix errors that it originally created. That was an interesting part of it. And I, I left that out of the paper because it, the paper would have been, you know, three times as long if I put all the error correction in there. So, you know, I don't know, maybe the magic of post-production, I made it look a little easier than it was. <laughs> but I did, I did not write a single line of code for that. Chat GPT did write all the code. There just was some uh, some bug fixes that happened in the background that I didn't. Yeah, yeah. There's always background bug fixes, isn't there? No, that's fine. <laughs> and and uh, we might get back around to the concept of prompt engineering later in the conversation, even though it's, I don't know whether it's a term that I'm fully accepting yet, because there's a part of me that thinks that the role of a prompt engineer shouldn't exist. These, you know, you, you shouldn't need to think about the questions that you should be asking. You know, the, the AI should get to the point where it can understand context, but either way we, we can, we can come onto that if, if we need to, but I just wanted to backtrack a little bit. And the reason for the next question, and it, it wasn't in the list of topics that I sent to you, Glenn, I, I apologize. Um, but as you know, I do a lot of work with finance teams, um, and running a podcast like tech for finance with the advent of stuff like chat GPT. People are coming to me, you know, saying, you know, we want to leverage these technologies, you know, we want a bit of guidance, you know, where, where do we start? 
And it's very difficult because, you know, you and I sort of breathe this tech on a day-to-day basis, but finance teams that may be working a slightly dated way, there's still quite a big jump to go from legacy applications to an advanced business that is making strategic decisions with AI that's plugged into to their data. And I just want to go back to a point quickly from, from your book. Um, and you must have people quoting from your book all the time. So sorry, sorry, but, um, and, and I won't read the, the whole quote, but there's a section that says that there's four stages of digital transformation. So you've got AI, but then you've got robotic process automation and machine learning, you know, within that as well, but they're all small pieces in a larger puzzle of digital transformation. And like any good puzzle, it must be approached intentionally and strategically. So what I'm saying at the moment is you can't just plug an advanced AI platform into a dated process where either the people or the foundations aren't producing accurate data. Cause, cause it's all, it's all about the data when you look at it. Right. And I'll let you respond in a second, but before I forget about it, the point that you made there about, you know, you used the, the point of sale project as an example. So you had to get data from point of sale systems. And I think I read in the book, whether it's that project or another one that you, I don't know whether you got fed up your main priorities, I just need the data. You know, I need the data to, to make these decisions. So I don't care who the software provider is, you know, providing the, the point of sale front end. I just want somebody to give me access to the data. And I think that's the right approach to take process data first and then accuracy before we can start getting into these advanced tools. So I don't know whether you can speak around that a little bit. Yeah, I can. And if, uh, if I start rambling again, just wave your hand and say, it's shut fine. up, Glenn. You know, because, yeah. <laughs> So, okay. So let me back it up because this has been a pivotal part of my finance career. And it's probably the weirdest thing for a CFO to do when he comes in on day one. But when I show up at a company, the first thing I want to do is, and I call it an ISO 9000 audit. And it, it was based on that. And again, I'm showing my age, um, oh, with, with talking about ISO, I don't know if anybody even talks about that anymore, but. The purpose of this audit is not to um, uh, get ISO certified. That's not the businesses I'm in. That wouldn't wouldn't matter for anything. But it is a nice framework, and really, all that I'm doing, and I'm just taking components of it. But I want to look at the processes where there are gaps, where there are manual entry, where you know potential error points, um, what people are involved in. What I want to do when I come in as the CFO is understand what information we have, what we're collecting, what we're not collecting. And this goes all the way back to from prospect to lead to wine to bringing them into the system and putting them in whatever a, a provisioning system, a CRM, a, well, CRM, they'd be early, but um, a um, you know project management tool, the accounting system, all everything that's going in. I want to understand that data flow and see where, uh, maybe we're, we've got customer information, in the CRM, and then we're redoing all that, you know, manually entering it into the accounting system where somebody could fat finger an email address or mess up the billing contact, or you don't have the billing contact in one system and you, you do in another. And the reason that I want to do all this is because when I start thinking about when I'm going to have to report to investors, to boards, to the rest of the management team, I want to know what that world of data that I have is, and then where there's any gaps. And it would be really nice, you know, for our customer acquisition cost, if we could tie back and uh, figure out how much we spent, you know, on the front end on advertising or whatever the case is, or if uh, I have some information about the customer that's in one system and not in another, um, and I can't see if there's a customer that is late on paying their bills. And I can't see in the CRM system that they've actually had a lot of support issues with us. I mean, it, it, it just, it all feeds together, whether I'm reporting on it or acting on it. So step one is understand that process. And then, because if you just throw and whether you're doing an ERP implementation or trying to bring in new technology like AI or, or machine learning into your tech stack, it's garbage in garbage out. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it's first understanding the data you have, understanding the process flows, understanding where, how you can integrate that data across all the systems. And then you can start looking at, and I don't mean 
pick a software platform and just throw that at it and say, this is going to fix everything. It is figure out the requirements first and then have the software or whatever you're adding to your tech stack, make sure that it is meeting the needs that you need. And you're not just jumping on the latest bandwagon, or you got a really good salesperson for some off the shelf, uh, accounting software that, um, uh, you know, did a good sales job. Just make sure you understand at the fundamental level, what it is you're trying to do and what you have currently. Mm. And I think it's, it's, it's so important to make sure that there's, there's that initial benchmark to say, this is where we are. And then, as you say, instead of just lumping a load of, you know, stuff that you can justify a business case with, you know, oh, this AI tool is going to enable us to save, you know, 20% of our day or, you know, 70% of our day, the, the, is the questions first, right? It's, you know, we know what our baseline is. We've got that benchmark. What questions do we need to be asking to produce the results that we need? And then fill in the, fill in the gaps from there, because when you start getting into RPA territory, and I, and I suppose it's wrong to say that you can't use AI full stop unless you get your process sorted, because there are some tools that are there to improve accuracy of data input, for example, you know, so, so even basic systems now you can set up with a validation that says, if somebody tries to overlay this dimension against this GL code warning, you're not, you're not meant to do that. So I don't want to misspeak and say that te technology can't support this sort of stuff. But it'll only work if you first define the process and the end goal for what needs to come out the other end, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just, it's amazing to me how, uh, I mean, it's for, for me, I'm enough of a geek that getting into that process level and doing your workflows and, and, uh, diagrams and, you know, showing how data is passing through. I love that stuff. Um, I, I don't know that I'm normal in that, but you can't. You can't make decisions without the, the full picture of the landscape that you're, that you're doing it in. So, um, yeah. And, and, and to your point, there are systems out there that are kind of made. And I think as AI improves, you know, maybe systems will make, impl you know, implementation of these systems will be, become easier because the tool that is, that we're buying to fix this problem may be able to be more intuitive and help us figure out what we, we don't know, but for, for now, and to me, for the foreseeable future, it's got to start with, uh, your foundation of processes and understanding what data you have. And, you know, you could have the same data in, in multiple systems. So which one is the source of truth? And when you're feeding it in, uh, that's something very important to keep up, uh, to keep track of. And especially if you've got systems going back and forth, talking to each other. And like you said, there are tools that can keep you from overriding one, but if you don't give that thought before you put the tools in place, you could have the wrong system, uh, you know, keeping that piece of information and overriding the good information with bad data. Mm. So if, if we imagine that the people have got the, the process piece sorted and we've got a tick box that says, we're pretty confident that the data is accurate. We know what our master source of data is. We know what the relationship is between our, between our systems, you know, and whether that's a, an end-to-end ERP or whether it's a, a couple of applications that we do have completely integrated. Yeah. So we know that we are working from a single source of the truth. What would be a good starting point? And again, taking the chat GPT hat off for a second, for yes. people that are wanting to get a, a feel for how potentially machine learning or, or some sort of predictive tool can help start allowing them to spot stuff that they wouldn't otherwise know. So I guess the short version of the question is to people that have got the data sorted, what's the entry level step with more advanced AI tech? Yeah. So the entry level step is basic statistics. I mean, and that's, what's so crazy. And we, we don't think about this, but even, even GPT is a statistical model. It is a. It is predicting what the most likely next word is based on a series of words and, you know, trained on billions of parameters. It, it gets pretty smart at this, but I think before you start diving into doing support vector machines or, or more complex machine learning algorithms, understanding basic statistical models that would let you you take a, a list of features, you don't know if there's correlation between all these, uh, variables and what you're trying to measure, but 
basic statistics lets you figure out if there are correlations and then, and I'm thinking of just building a, a, a typical statistical model. You find, uh, out of your, I don't know, hundred, 200, however many features you have, um, and, uh, which features are correlated to what you're trying to measure. And then you find out which are most correlated. And then you build a model, uh, a statistical model that makes predictions based on what you have. And I think without an understanding of that, it's, you know, once you understand that, then you can look at, I mean, and there's all kinds of, you know, drag and drop and, and drag and drop. I don't mean that, uh, even me necessarily who lives and breathes this stuff could go in and just easily do it. But I'm thinking of tools like TensorFlow and Keras and PyTorch and the, um, tools that have made these machine learning algorithms much more accessible to people who know what they're doing. Um, it's easier than it used to be. And obviously with the compute power being what it is now, that makes that easier. But I think before you can even look at, before you even need to look at more complex, um, machine learning models, you need to understand the basic statistical models. And I don't know what, you know, what your audience demographic is, but for the world that I live in, um, uh, small and mid-sized enterprises typically don't have enough internal data that would even justify doing more than a basic statistical model. But if you do, if you're, you know, an IOT company that has all kinds of data coming in from your devices out there, I mean, there are, you know, there's all kinds of examples where you would, but to think, especially if you're someone who hasn't been following it to think, oh, we're just going to throw some, we're going to throw AI at this, which people would normally mean just machine learning algorithms and, and try to figure it out. That's not the place to start. Uh, it is a basic understanding. And I think there's tools out there and I love this tool. I had access to it when I was a student, it is very expensive for an individual, but data robot is an amazing tool that lets you dump your data in. it'll run several different machine learning algorithms on it to make predictions. You can pick the model that you want to use and, uh, and, you know, use your data, uh, that way without having to be a true data engineer, but the danger is it's a, it, if you're just throwing this stuff into a black box and I know neural networks are always kind of in just one type of uh, machine learning, but you know, neural networks are always a black box where you don't, you can understand the process that's going on, but it's, it's always kind of magic what happens in those, um, in those middle layers in a neural network. But if you're just throwing stuff in a model and then presenting that as if it's fact, it's like, it's like believing when chat GPT has a hallucination and tells you something that's wrong. I mean, the machine will pick out with seemingly great certitude, what, what it wants you to, uh, you know, what, what it's trying to tell you. But if you don't understand what's happening in the, in the model that you've picked, how can you be, how can you trust the results that come out of that? So, and, and you're dead right. And, it, and it's, it's a bit of a tangent. So I was, I was listening to, I can't remember who the, the, the dude was, but. Um, they were talking about some of the early stage, um, meta AIs that they were working on, which again, they were, they were, they were language models similar to, um, similar to chat GT, how GPT, just not quite as advanced. Um, and they used the example of the AI producing a justification for how eating glass was good for you. And, and intuitively that we as, we as humans though. You shouldn't eat glass, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> I mean, but to your point there, it, it included citations, you know, it was that inclusive and convincing in its response that at first glance, you'd think there's a point there. You see what I mean? And, and that's, that's again, and we're going on to a different topic here, which is obviously how much can you trust the machine at this moment in time, but. That's why whenever I'm speaking to people, it's, it comes down to that validation, validation, you know, check, 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 because just because something's giving you a convincing response doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. And it's the same with people as well. People can give you a convincing response based on their credibility, but they might not be right either. So it's, again, it's, I guess something to, to watch out for, but, but you're dead right. You know, applying a machine learning algorithm to accurate data is one thing as an entry level, you know, providing, as you say, you've got the, the volume of data there. But then applying something generative, you know, with the advent of GPT-4 now, that's now got access to live data, you know, there's a shed load of information on the internet. It's just downright wrong. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, and I'm, I am, uh, an evangelist for all this stuff. I, I love it. And I'm so excited about chat. I, I keep a, a chat GPT tab open in my browser all the time. Same. I'm just always testing it. <laughs> Same. That said, I have, uh, never put any actual production data, like any, any you know, proprietary information mm -hmm. or anything into chat GPT. I always, you know, I've, uh, like when I did that project, I would dump my, uh, CSV files, or I would just copy and paste the table in and see what chat GPT could answer on that. But it is, it is a novelty at this point to me. I mean, I don't think the the publicly available interface on the web that you use is a novelty. Nobody. And I think, uh, the companies, um, who have said, do not <laughs> use chat GPT for company information. I think they are right, but, um, I think it's a novelty right now and it is a we can call it a proof of concept to say, this is the power of what this can do. But until you have, and th there's already companies out there that are doing this. And I think that that over the next 12 months is going to be the very exciting next phase of what generative AI is doing. There are companies who are taking the GPT base and applying it to different industries, different professions, and making it experts at whether it's law or medicine or FPNA. Um, and, uh, so then you could, and if you could, you know, figure that, that whoever is the startups that are applying GPT in this way, figure out a way to protect your proprietary information, give you this interface. That's a chat bot that you can ask. This is my dream. And I think it's getting closer to reality every day where any stakeholder can, you know, the same way we have dashboards, visual dashboards right now, you know, dashboards are great. They give you all this information at a glance. But drilling down sometimes, you know, in Tableau or whatever, you can have one level deep that somebody can click on and see, but to really answer questions, you have to go to an analyst. Um, but I think in the very near future, in a situation where you have this chat bot that can operate in a closed system that doesn't expose your, and this, this is leave out the compute part of it. That's, uh, for engineers to solve more than me, but, uh, um, but that you basically can ask just like you would your, um, Amazon device, um, you know, ask it a question about your data and get results, whether it's talking to it, typing it in, get a report that maybe in a, in a current environment, you have a report request, it goes into the, um, backlog that in the finance team and whoever's doing your reports, it may take them a week to get to your request and get it back to you. Uh, this is going to be real time, good financial information that you will be able to to trust more than just plugging something into a open, uh, you know, a HTTP interface. So. Yeah. And, and that's, so if, if I could summarize it at the moment, um, and may, maybe I'm off, I don't know. I'm, I'm by no means the expert in this, but the, the best term for me at the moment is co-pilot. And, and I know that's an official term, I think in, in GitHub. So, so I had Adam Sigourney, who's, um, who's building, uh, an FPNA tool specifically for SaaS companies. So you can't talk about that industry approach that you mentioned there. He's doing that. Um, and he built chat GPT into his similar to, um, Chris Bell, who's building chat GPT into zero as well. So, so it's similar concepts We're we're slowly seeing that emergence as, as you say. Um, but the reason I, I term co-pilot and it goes back to our, our previous conversation about predictive text, right? You know, it, when, when you take all the frills away at the moment is kind of, we're into that, you know, the AI is just kind of filling in the gaps for you. So GitHub Copilot, obviously it slashes the time it takes him to code because as he's coding, it's, it's using its intelligence to say, oh, we think that you're doing this, or we think that you need to add in this snippet and we think that you need to do this, that, and the other. I've also referred to it as, um, like a, an, an AI assistant sort of outsourcing to, to an AI assistant. Um, but I think to, to rely on it at this stage, and again, I welcome, I welcome your perspective here. So going back to your points about the jigsaw puzzle pieces and the concept of, you know, AI doesn't exist in a silo, you know, there's RPA, you know, there's the other fundamentals in terms of automation that, that we can use as part of this wider transformation. You know, we need to be careful that we don't confuse stuff like generative AI as a, as an R RPA replacement tool. Because that, because they serve two completely different purposes. So RPA is great. If you have a structured, do this, then do that, do this, do then do that. If you try to give that instruction to a generative AI model, like chat GPT three, 
you're going to get wildly different results and it's just not fit for that purpose. I, I don't know whether you'd agree from, from your experience with that as well. Uh, as of state of tech today, yes, but I did, uh, I was over the last couple of days, just seeing what we can expect from GPT four, yeah. I was, um, uh, you know, uh, reading some of the Google paper, well, not necessarily on GPT four, but on the sort of the next generation of where GPT is going and the models, uh, whether, you know, whether it's Facebook's or Google's or, or open AI, um, are getting better at making inferences and at understanding jokes, uh, at, mm -hmm. at taking things out of context. And you, uh, a lot of the papers would go side by side with, you know, existing GPT three, the res response you get where GPT three says, I don't understand. And the, um, in GPT four or similar, I mean, you're now starting to get to a point where on some of these responses, there's that they're already above sort of the midline of, um, what human responders can answer, um, in getting close to the, the top of that line. Um, and, uh, <laughs> the way that they measured it was, uh, you know, mechanical Turk on, um, uh, the Amazon where you hire people to go through and, uh, and do jobs for you. So they, uh, as part of the training of the model, they hired a bunch of mechanical Turk contractors to, um, answer questions and then rate them how they answered compared to GPT. And so GPT three stayed kind of below the, uh, midline of that. So, you know, like it's writing is more, you know, it's, it's very basic elementary writing styles and in the same way it does everything. But with these newer iterations, you're going to see the responses that come from the computer get closer to the top of that curve. And I guess once it goes past that curve, I don't, we're probably close to the singularity. <laughs> not, not really because, and actually I do, I do want to, I do want to throw this out. I mean, that will be great when you can get a response from a computer that is maybe better than 98, you know, it's, it's a Mensa level computer. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's very important for all of us to remember, this is a large language model doing predictive text. It is nowhere near even on the spectrum of sentience. So, you know, it's, uh, and I think, you know, for uh, thinking about Ray Kurzweil and the singularity, and I think that that is very different than what you can just get from a predictive text model, which they, they're getting, uh, really good. And they're going to, it's going to be amazing to see where this goes because it's moving so quickly where it goes in the next few years. But, uh, I don't think we're right on the doorstep of, uh, our, um, AIs having, uh, sentience and personalities and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And, and, and to be fair, I think going back to the point I made earlier about you know, this, this whole sort of hype about, you know, the need for prompt engineers and, you know, the, the people that are basically telling other people how, how to ask better questions of AI, you know, is that, that's so meta, isn't it? You know, you've got somebody telling somebody else how to ask better questions to an AI, you know, ask us this 10 years ago, but we have, you know, we, we wouldn't even thought that we'd be in this situation, but the reason I come back to that, and it's a, it's a point that, um, both Chris and Adam on the previous podcast pointed out is the biggest limitation we have with the likes of chat GPT and whatever the similar models are out there is it's in the user interface at the moment. You know, it's, it's, as you say, you've got your tab open, you know, but we're, we're copying and pasting text, you, you, you know, that, that whole interaction is in itself clunky and doesn't make for the best responses. Because the minute you've got to think about how do I ask a question is the minute that, you know, you, you're kind of spending time and attention that you shouldn't really be spending on, on this sort of thing. So as soon as we get to the point where, and I use the example of my notion, for example, so I use notion, um, bang on about it all the time, but my notion is a massive repository of my brain, essentially my thoughts go into it. So if chat GPT can go into my notion and it understands the way that I speak in my sentiment. In theory, it shouldn't have to guess as much when I'm asking chat GPT questions because it knows my language and it knows how to infer the meaning behind my words. So I'm hoping the improvements come there to the point where we don't need prompt engineers because the AI should be intuitive enough to be able to understand the context. But again, I don't know how far we are off that. Yeah. And really, I mean, if, if you think about the way GPT was trained and is specifically taking it from GPT to chat GPT, the language models are currently being charged chat GPT was trained first on, uh, 
just doing the predictive text. And then the next round of training was human interaction. And so humans would go and uh, put in prompts and get the response from, or they'd get say three or five responses from uh, GPT. And then the humans would wait, which was the best response, you mm -hmm. know, all the way down. And that's how they got it to be much better at interacting with humans and understanding the prompts and what to put out. So in your example, um, you could take another layer of fine tuning and say, I'm, um, a podcaster and an FPNA expert, and these are my notes and review my notes and understand the kind of things I'm talking about, the way that I structure sentences or whatever, and then fine tune the model on that. And maybe there's even some example where you, when people in your company are using, doing the same kind of training that people did with, um, chat GPT, uh, to get that first level of training and it's just further fine tuning the model to be specific to what you're doing. So I, I think that's kind of a logical next step, um, for, uh, um, what, what's to come with these future iterations and very industry and profession and even potentially person specific, uh, GPT models. Yeah. Well, it com comes back to that, you know, virtual AI assistant, doesn't it? You know, we, we will get to the point and let's come back to your point about the singularity and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, it, it will become before there is replacement, there will be augmentation right? and we've already got, um, studies of Japanese companies that are getting AI to read human thoughts, you know, and, and all of that sort of stuff. We're entering scary territory there, but I always kind of like the, the thought of, um, I don't know whether you ever watched Dragon Ball Z or anything like that, you know, it's, um, no, I don't like <laughs> Dragon Ball Z. but anyway, the, the, um, all the characters in Dragon Ball Z, they've got like a little lens that goes over the right hand side of their face. It's like a, a heads up display is all that it is, you know. The equivalent in modern day is Google Glass and, and I think Ray-Ban are now building a Facebook portal or meta portal into their glasses now. Um, and to me, I think it's, it's going to be an iteration of that, you know, before, before we have any of this, you know, um, sentience or anything like that, I think it's going to augment our capability on an individual basis, whereby we are getting the best of both worlds. So we've got our human brain, but then we've also got a model like ChatGPT that's feeding us with knowledge that is giving us guidance, that is being that co-pilot that we mentioned earlier. So it's going to be interesting to see the way that that develops, I guess. So, but forgetting it a little bit now about the pie in the sky stuff, which, which I love talking about, and it's nice to, to have an eye for the future. But when we now think of practical applications of some, some of these platforms. So we, we've said in earlier parts of the discussion that obviously the starting point is foundations, data, end goal where are you headed? Then the entry level in terms of AI is to start building some of these machine learning, um, models into our data set, whether the end result is, you know, um, predictions from an FPNA perspective or, you know, spotting trends as maybe not even just a finance team, but as a wider business that's trying to spot trends from data from different departments and that sort of stuff, which is fine. So at the moment I see technologies like GPT potentially having more wins for individuals over businesses and, and coming back to the co-pilot piece, you know, with the softer stuff, like, you know, writing job descriptions and the stuff that is actually the, the text-based stuff, that's, that's where I'm seeing the real time saving because it's not relying on pinpoint accuracy. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first piece, I guess in our last conversation, we talked about chat GPT being a really poor mathematician. So, uh, I think you, you can probably speak to the, the Wolfram alpha piece that we spoke about last time. And then the last question that I've got before I ask my standard set of questions, um, is what you think the shift is going to be with a multimodal solution like GPT four against what we're seeing at the moment. So the first piece is practical applications for GPT as you see it now, and whether my thinking is aligned with yours and more of the softer side of things. And then your perspective on what we're going to see in terms of shift with the, the later generation of GPT. Yeah. And I think a great example would be, um, I would use GPT and I, I do similar things with this. So say I pick up a new client that is an industry that I haven't worked in before. And before I 
have the introductory call with my new client, I might say, what are some key metrics that we need to look at in uh, the manufacturing or con construction industry? Say? And it, it actually can, you know, it will give you some pretty good information. And you get, the great thing is you get some sort of high level items and you can, with the prompts, you can say, give me some more ideas or drill in on this. And so if you're, I mean, I think about right now with, uh, without chat GPT, if I'm trying to figure out key metrics that are important to a client or an industry, um, or, you know, depending on the scale of the business, the kind of things I'm looking at, I'm, I might still go back to Google and, you know, see what, what other people have written about it, but, um, being able to ask chat GPT for things like that, it makes it much quicker. Or, uh, like I was setting up a, a new client intake form this morning and I asked, uh, chat GPT, what are, what's some good information I'd like to just to make sure to kind of check myself, what's some information I'd like to include on a client intake form. So all that soft skill stuff is, is great. And it really does facilitate, or if I'm, uh, you know, I, I contribute a lot to different publications and I would never, first off, I'd be embarrassed to think that somebody wrote would believe that I wrote as badly as chat GPT, <laughs> but, but, um, but I have used it for ideas. If I have to, um, you know, do a new Forbes article every month or whatever I'm submitting to, I might say, Hey, I'm, I want to target, uh, private equity backed businesses. What are some, um, article ideas you have for me? And then I would take the idea and use it. So there are ways that individually, like you said, you could, uh, find just save, uh, save time and, and be more productive. But if I were wanting to run a model, just like I would just drag and drop a data set without thoroughly understanding the data set into something like data robot, where I don't thoroughly understand, uh, what the processing of that data is doing, I would never do that and then report that to anything that mattered, like, you know, what's the, actually the, the key part of my job, because we are, we have to be very accurate, precise, mm -hmm. but I, uh, so I wouldn't do that today, but I really do think it's going to be sooner than later that we're, we are doing just that with that, with production data, you know, once we're insured and you'll still have to, it's, we're not even to trust, but verify yet. We're like, I, I think I start with don't trust, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think, you know, we'll get to it and then there's going to be a long period where, okay, the, the robot says this, but let's understand why it's saying that and check it, check our answers against it. So that'll be a big step when we get, when we do get to trust to verify where mm -hmm. first blush, it seems right, but let's figure out how we got there. So, but we're not, we're not close to there yet. Yeah. And the, the, the wolf from alpha piece then. I don't have to spend long on this, but of course, you know, Wolfram Alpha is quite a, a, a well-known, um, facility that is, I mean, you're probably better to describe it than I, but there's, there's a theory that says, you know, for what chat GPT lacks in, you know, uh, mathematical knowledge, there's potentially a, a means of plugging the gap by connecting it with something like Wolfram Alpha. Yeah. And that's important because, uh, in. GPT-4, again, we're going to say it will be better at doing a uh, slightly more complex math, but the way, the way that the, the GPT model works is very different than what a math engine would do. It is saying, oh, I've, I'm making inferences based on this number you gave me, or, you know, this trying to, you know, maybe it's getting better at reading word problems, for example, and, you know, for simple math like that. But if you're trying to at scale, have a computer system that is generating your key financial metrics, your ratios, the, everything that you're tracking, that's like asking the librarian to do your physics homework for you. You know, it's, uh, it, it's probably she could, she or he could do it, but that's not, you know, if you're going to really ask someone to do your physics homework for you, it'd be great to find a physicist to do it. So I think that the integration between a large language model and a math engine. And if you wanted to make it a, a full purpose, like, you know, this is pie in the sky stuff down, but eh, it's not really because everything's moving so quickly, but you could have the chat bot as the front end. And even I, I'm seeing people already doing this where they're building kind of a decision engine behind the chat prompts that then say, 
Um, I think I can answer this, but this is a, um, you know, statistics question. Let's kick this one over to Wolfram Alpha, or I think I can answer this, but the user is trying to play, uh, Alpha Go or to play Go with me. Let's just use Alpha Go. That's just, you know, one example. So it, that it, you know, if you had a decision engine behind that chat interface and it could direct those queries, then you start having someone that, um, or someone is, I'm already personifying it here. <laughs> you start a, a system that can interact with you on all kinds of levels. And that's where it starts to get really interesting. And then, you know, going back to our singularity reference earlier, may not be sentient, but it's going to look and feel sentient when it's able to interact in all these levels of your life. So I suppose that leads nicely onto the second part of the question, which is, you know, the potential for, for G, GPT-4 as the next iteration. And, and, and I'll go back to your, your book for a second here. Um, so your book touches on the subject of, of narrow AI, which, which is, which is basically AI that's pointed at a specific purpose, right? You know, and, and maybe to use uh, an example that more people understand, um, more and more now when you're using teams and zoom and all of this sort of stuff, there are AI that sits within them that will record the conversation and then the AI will do the transcription. And then we're even now getting to the point where the AI won't just do the transcription, it will pull out the key points and it'll also do a summary for you as well. So correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, that's a narrow AI because it serves particular for focus and it's developed for that end in mind. But it strikes me that chat GPT potentially expands beyond that, whereby you've got a type of AI that doesn't just extend to stuff like audio, because we know it's multimodal. That would just basically means it's going to be able to accept more inputs or types of different media inputs and be able to output different types of um, output that aren't just text. So what do you see as the key difference between a multimodal AI such as GPT-4 compared to a narrow AI such as the example that I gave just there? Because the question that people will be asking themselves is, well, it's, it's the question people always ask themselves when I get invest in new systems. Do I do, do I get one system that does everything or do I, do I have a pointed solution for each of those different business cases? So whether you can talk around that a little bit. Yeah. Then it's not, the funny thing is, I think even when I wrote book, uh, Naively, maybe I, my perception of general AI was that it was synonymous with sentient and it's not, uh, not, not, you know, the way, the way that I look at it now, but it, a general AI can perform broad range of functions, probably, you know, I, I don't know the super technical definition of it, but would it say that this AI can perform every function that uh, a human could do? And then you have this one piece of software, uh, bot or whatever it is that can, uh, it, do your physics homework. It can, um, give you recipe ideas. It can transcribe your meetings and also drive your core or, you know, place an order, uh, online for you for, uh, for delivering. I mean that, cause you know, the self-driving cars, that is a narrow AI that it just is made for driving the car. And, um, but the more that you integrate these and. Then the other thing I wonder is, so, but we're also talking about linked narrow AIs versus one combined system that can do all of this. So there's, there is a difference there. So a large language model is very far from being general AI, but if you can cobble together enough things that can all interact with each other, it's, you know, it's like we have different parts of our brain that have different functions, it maybe starts to look and feel like general AI, but, um, this single, you know, unified AI that can do everything. And I guess that's really the difference is if you are having to cobble together different machines and, and, and different programs, does that kind of general AI? I think no, even if it does look like it. So you're looking for, you know, that would be the holy grail of this AI does everything in turn and with a, but in a connected world. Does it matter? I mean, it's really about what the end user, what the experience is. And if it feels like general AI, then I think 
Absolutely, absolutely. And and again, some of the use cases, I mean, some of the LinkedIn posts, there's conversations going to say, oh, I'm keen to learn about what AIs can support me in developing my presentations. You know, um, so, you know, as you say, if you do have, even if it is a combination of narrow AI tools within the tool set, you know, whether somebody uses two systems or one, you've achieved the same objective, haven't you? So I've got a tool helps me visualize my data in for the purpose of presentations. And then I've also got the same, same tool that also helps me transcribe my meeting notes, you know, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, we, we'll have to see whether those different types of input, you know, then add up to chat GPT learning more and whether it does become a little bit more autonomous in, in its inputs. But again, it's still, it's still unknown territory. Yeah. So. Okay, that's that's fab. So to, to be continued, I guess. I mean, yeah. To me, and again, I don't really want to make predictions. We've mentioned the concept of GPT three as being kind of like a co-pilot, you know, an AI assistant. You know, great for potentially more individual use than trying to also make business processes. You know, I think I think you and I kind of agreed on that. I think with the advent of GPT four, if it can produce imagery and it can recognize audio and that sort of stuff, with we're potentially just seeing that on steroids. There's potentially not wider applications apart from just being able to communicate and producing more outputs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really th this next wave of what the applications are is going to depend on, uh, very creative engineers and, and founders who are going to take this to the next level. Um, so I, you know, without playing around with it, I've certainly uh, read a lot on what it's going to do, but it's, it's going to feel a lot more like, uh, you know, that executive assistant that can do a lot more, uh, you know, and I could see it being, I mean, where most of us are doing typing interfaces with it, but imagine this power just behind the Amazon devices that everybody has, or the Apple home or whatever, you know, Google home or whatever devices they have. If you've got that level of power, uh, that you can chat with, I mean, it, it just changes again, and we're, we're thinking individual here and not company. Um, but I, you know, I think you can extrapolate from that, how, if you had a system like this, that could go through and just like dashboards kind of really changed FP and A and, and reporting company metrics, this is going to be the next wave that is even bigger than dashboard because you can ask it anything about your data. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and. I mean, whether it is individual or business, I mean, one of the primary focuses of these tools is freeing up time, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to a quote from your book again, um, which is knowledge is power. And by understanding how to use data in order to make the most menial data related tasks, you can gain more power and share that power with your team, you know, um, invoicing clients, paying invoices and doing reports aren't powerful job responsibility. You know, not when you compare them to taking all of that data that you have and combining it with other data in the company and becoming a strategic partner. So, so I don't know about you, but I don't care whether I get that time back from having a pers personal assistant or whether I'm running an AI model of my data to help me with my predictions, I'm still free my time so I can become a better business partner. Yeah. And it's all about moving people from mindless work to mindful work. And the question is at some point, you know, when the AI gets better and better, it's like, how mindful do you, are you going to start excluding large swaths of the population that maybe can't operate up at the, you know, in the 98th percentile or whatever that the computer is doing. So it's, I mean, you know, we don't need to get into a whole universal basic income conversation but <laughs> like this makes, you know, makes it seem more like eh, somebody might need to start planning for <laughs> Yeah. I'm not going to think too heavily about that. I don't Yeah. <laughs> no, I appreciate that again. So, so I'll ask you the, the questions that I, I always ask, um, and then you can tell people where to find more, more, more about, you. um, you, the response to this answer can't be a smartphone. Yeah. So I, I get that response. Um, I won't say it's a cop out because smartphones are useful. Um, but the question is, you know, what app or gadget in either your personal or professional life, could you not live without? Um, so, <laughs> so people, if people are watching the video, they'll see that my video looks different now than it did when we started. It had some technical issues. The uh, internet crashed in the middle of the recording. Um, but so my response would have been because I've spent the last 
setting it up. I've got a new office. I've got this 4K camera. I've got uh, my uh, podcast microphone, my headphones and everything set up. And it was, I was just really two days ago, I thought, this is perfect. I've got the huge monitors. I can, you know, be doing everything at once. <laughs> so that was going to be my answer was this uh, great uh, new setup that I have with my uh, computer. But since it's crashed, I've got to, I've got to kick that to the curb. This is not my favorite technology. Um, in my personal life, uh, I, I'm a runner and a biker. And so uh, activity trackers are, uh, I, I rely on those a lot, but it's, I've been doing this experiment and it's driving me crazy. And I think you'll be able to relate to this as a numbers guy. Yeah. So I've got my phone, my Garmin watch and my Apple watch, and I've got certain routes that I run, uh, you know, multiple times a week and on every one of those routes. Every one of those devices gives me a different answer to how far it is. And I know, so if I use my phone, it actually measures that it's further distance. So I like to use my phone because it makes it look like I'm running faster. Uh, okay. I'm, this, it, yeah. So, um, so even my favorite devices, clearly I'm, I'm fighting with technology every day, which is, uh, kind of the story of being a tech evangelist, right? You're just, no, it, I, activity track is a great, you know, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big advocate of, you know, you've got to get the health right before you can get anything else right. Right. You know, it's, it's no point. Oh, what was the quote? It was an amazing quote. Um, somebody that's healthy is something like somebody that's healthy. There's, um, you know, endless possibilities or they can think about everything, but for somebody who's unhealthy, they can only think about one thing. Yeah. Oh, well, what that one thing is getting healthy. Right. You know, so and, yep. unless you get that right, you, you can't. So I'll add a part two to that question, which is. Is there anything in tracking your metrics that you learned that you've been able to improve from that you wouldn't have had if you were just running without a tracker? Uh, yes. So when I first started running a million years ago, when I was back when I was racing a source, it was, it, 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 well, I would just, my workouts would be, I don't know, I'm just going to go run as long as I can or run as fast as I can. I might mix it up with some speed work or whatever in the, in the middle of it, but didn't think anything about heart rates. Mm. So now through watching my heart rate and my level of exertion, I can tailor my training for, okay, this is my long run. I need my heart rate to be in this band when I'm doing speed work. This is my max heart rate. This is where I need to be. If I'm doing a hit workout or, or whatever it is, or if, you know, if I just want to see how much work I did pedaling uh, my bike up a hill, it's pretty amazing to see, um, the, uh, uh, you know, you, cause you can actually, with these trackers, you can see your change in altitudes and you can know you climbed at this angle, this was your heart rate, this was your speed. And you can start to sort of factor in and you can really fine tune your, uh, what you're training for. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and as a data geek, I'm constantly, you know, trying to figure out wait, what I can surmise from looking at my heart rate and distance and speed and weather conditions, you know, you, they're all features that you can use in a model. Uh, however, I will say, and I don't know if this is, you know, human versus, I don't know, all, I've not come up with a good, and maybe this becomes a product if I do, but I've not been able to come up with a good predictive tool other than just looking at pace for knowing what my 5k time is going to be or whatever. It's like, okay, my training, you know, I did this many miles, th this many weeks before and all that. And it's, uh, I haven't come up with the, uh, the model for it, but the data is there. So I can keep playing around with it and see if I, I can use that same predictive, um, uh, tool that I use for, for business, for my personal life. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on this. Please do. No, that's, that's great. And, and before I get, we, we mentioned the other book that you're writing, that's the, 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 the sci-fi one, right? Did, did we have a rough day for that? Are we, are nope. we getting close? So that thing is, is 98% done and it's been 98% done for a couple of years. And meanwhile, it's sitting on my uh, hard drive, gathering digital dust. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I think, uh, with everything going on, uh, right now, it's going to be a while before I can dust it off, but maybe it's, maybe it'll be a good summer project to get that thing, uh, wrapped up and see what happens with it. Okay. Let me know. I'll read it. Yeah. We'll definitely read it. Cool. Yeah, All right. Maybe I'll let chat GPT finish it. Well, <laughs> Yeah, but it can't, it won't be able to process the text. It, 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 it's too long, right? You know, yeah, yeah. this book for me. Oh, sorry. I can only, I can only um, recognize the last page of text because my character limits. <laughs> yes. No, no, all good. So, so where, where can people find out more about you? 
Um, I probably LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> I told someone the other day that, uh, LinkedIn is the only social media uh, platform I'm on because, well, I think I'm on Twitter, but I don't really ever do anything over there. Um, it's the only social media platform where I don't log in and immediately want to argue with someone. So <laughs> it's the LinkedIn it is for me. So, yeah, fine. Okay. So we'll, we'll put links in, in the, in the show notes. I'll, I'll link to your book as well. Um, so pe people can check, check you out there, but, um, no, once again, I thank, I thank you to you, Glenn, and it, it, you say, you know, you've got a lot going on at the moment. Um, so, you know, to talk about this sort of stuff, I absolutely love. So you know, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise, likewise. And I apologize again for the technical difficulties, but I'm, I'm right. relying on your post-production capabilities. To oh, make we, we, <laughs> we have the technology and we have the degree in music production. So hopefully we'll, <laughs> all right, Glenn, see you later. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Adam.